Welcome to the Critical Practice Talks on the Black Arts Movement in Coventry series. My name is Tanisha Gabriel Fleer and I am the Project Assistant of the Black Arts Movement in Coventry Project, a project led by Carolina Rito and Coventry University. The Critical Practice Talks is a series of monthly conversations with researchers and practitioners in the fields of art, curating, critical theory and museum studies. These conversations explore the capabilities of practice to produce knowledge, advance critical inquiries and intervene in society. The conversation today with Sylvia Theory is part of the Critical Practices Talk strand, exploring the British Black Arts Movement activities in Coventry and the region from the late 1970s to the 1980s and its legacies today. Although underrepresented in the local art scene, art-related syllabi and prevailing local narratives, Coventry was home to the paradigm shift in British art history. Key figures of the movement, including Keith Piper and Eddie Chambers, met in the city when studying in the Art Foundation course at the Lanchester Polytechnic. Also, the Pan-African Connection exhibition was held at the Herbert Gallery and Museum in 1983 with works of Claudette Johnson, Wenda Leslie, Keith Piper, Donald Rodney, Janet Vernon and Eddie Chambers. Carolina and I invite a curator and researcher, Sylvia Theora, to tell us more about these stories. Dr. Sylvia Theore is an art educator, researcher, and independent curator. Sylvia is a lecturer in contextual fine art and photography at University of Wolverhampton. She holds a PhD from the University of Salford, which focused on the Black African students' experiences of higher education, art, and design. Her research interests include diversity and inclusion issues in art and design education, race, identity, and African diaspora, contemporary African art and Black arts movement, and curatorial strategies of resistance. Her recent publications include a book, the book chapter, Critical Race Theory and Relationship to Art Education in Towards Inclusive Arts Education. Sylvia was a curator in residence at the Herbert Art Gallery Museum between 2019 and 2020, working in partnership with New West Midlands International Curators Forum and Coventry Biennial. Her residence culminated in the exhibition, 13 Ways of Looking at the Herbert Art Gallery and Museum. Welcome and thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you for having me here, Tanisha and Carolina. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Just to echo also Tanisha's words, thank you so much for, for joining today, but also to for being part of the Black Arts Movement in Coventry project, not only by uh, giving one of the workshops, precisely looking at the history of the movement in Coventry, but also your involvement uh, in the shaping and also delivery of the, uh, the working groups. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, our interest really with this project is to look at the influence of the movement in Coventry, specifically also in the region, but because you've done some research specifically on what the movement, uh, uh, so, so how the movement was kind of influential locally, but also how their activities uh, took place in the late 70s and beginning of the 80s. I wanted to ask if you could tell us that story, that trajectory, and uh, why do you think that in Coventry or in the region, uh, it was was this movement has emerged there. Um, what do you think were the circumstances, the context that helped inform uh, this particular artistic activity? Um, I guess you know when we're talking about the emergence of the movement in the sort of late nineteen seventies and early nineteen eighties, um, it's important to think about how um, the Black Arts Movement here in Britain came out of a particular social and political condition experienced by British born children um, who, who had parents that who had come from the Caribbean. Um, so we, we know about kind of this history of um, what some people maybe like to call the, the Windrush generation. There were significant numbers of um, people from the Caribbean that came over from 1948 onwards. Um, although I think it's also important to kind of think about it in terms of um, David Olusoga, I hope I've got his name, David Olusoga's um, text, Black and British, A Forgotten History, where he talks about the Windrush myth, where we kind of are in a place where people kind of think about Black people having entered into Britain from 1948, but actually we know there's a, you know, that history goes further back and, you know, we have, we can go back as far as, back as the third century to kind of think about the black presence in, in the UK. So um, 
But I think in terms of thinking about the Black Arts Movement in Britain, it's important to think about that. Um, the pet, um, the, these artists, their parents came over um, in, the in 1948 onwards, and um, their children were the artists such as you know, Keith Piper and Eddie Chambers, who were the key pioneers of the Black Arts Movement. So uh, I think it's important to think about that moment and also important to, to think about what was happening at that time when um, these artists were growing up, you know, having been born and raised in Britain and growing up within this context as Black people. Um, and I think what, I was just going to sort of quickly read something here from David Olusaga's book where he, he says um, about his own experience and he grew up um, around the 1970s, 1980s, that was, you know, that was his childhood and he talks about um, this feeling of where he says, I imbibed enough of the background racial tensions of the late 1970s and 1980s to feel profoundly unwelcome in Britain. My right, not just to regard myself as a British citizen, but even to be in Britain seemed contested, which I think is important. So you have a generation of young people who are black, who've been born and brought up here, being made to feel as though this is not their home, whilst this is the only home that they've ever, ever known. Um, so you kind of have this background and, you know, we can talk about Britain in the 1980s, um, you know, was developing amidst a large number of riots and marches in which race was a key issue because um, young black people growing up in and around Britain, um, I think were kind of, you know, speaking up against some of the racial injustices that they were facing and saying, no, we won't sit back and kind of uh, be treated as second class citizens or not being accepted within um, the, the country. They kind of stood up to kind of um, challenge this. And so, you know, the early 1980s was a period which was rife with um, riots, particularly, the, you know, the early part of the decade. Um, and, you know, we can talk about, you know, Margaret Thatcher as well, you know, being prime minister and, you know, giving speeches where she talked about the country being swamped by immigrants, you know, this idea of British people um, seeing the character of their neighbourhoods changing because of certain um, groups that, you know, sort of you beginning to sort of view this, have this idea of black and British um, being seen as mutually exclusive. So you kind of have this narrative in the background and then you have um, young people um, growing up in and around this, in and around these tensions as David Olusoga has mentioned. Um, and I think that's kind of the social political context that um, the Black Arts Movement came out of. Um, you know, they, they sort of came together because they had a shared similar experience in relation to facing racism. Um, and also simultaneously, um, you know, being art students in art schools and feeling that there wasn't a space for them within that and also being aware that within um, galleries and museums and art institutions, you know, uh, black artists were being given a subsidiary space. And so this was the catalyst for this first generation of British born black artists um, rising up from these art colleges and, you know, creating a place for themselves through um, privately organized black art exhibitions. Um, and what these exhibitions and the movement and the artists, you know, went on to do was to challenge the established order of the art space and, you know, and beyond. Um, and so I think we can kind of think about it in terms of that being the, the background within which this um, movement emerged from and the circumstances in, in which it happened. Um, I don't know if that's answered the question. Or... Absolutely. No, absolutely. I was just wondering if you could now kind of zoom in to Coventry and give us a, give us a, a kind of a, the narrative of, of what happened there, because it, it seems to be kind of understudied and, and uh, not much literature really covers uh, what happened, you know, like Eddie Chamber and, and uh, Keith meeting, for instance, there in a foundation degree, but also what happens then with the exhibition in at the Herbert. If you could just give us that, um, kind of it tells us a bit more about those events and probably the reaction in Coventry, because I think that's crucial, isn't it, Sylvia? And you've done some research on that. If you could just tell us a, a bit more about that. Uh, I guess, you know, we could kind of think about, you know, we, we know that, you know, Eddie Chambers, you know, coming from Wolverhampton um, in the late 1970s, you know, he had created with the support of his mentor, Eric Pemberton, um, the Wolverhampton Black Art Group, um, 
And it was around, you know, just after he created that. And then he was also then studying um, at Lanchester Polytechnic, in Co which is now Coventry University. And it was there that he met Keith Piper. And so the activities that Eddie Chambers was involved in, in terms of this notion around um, blackness and art and activism, he had already kind of began the foundations for that and then um, met Keith in Coventry. And I think there was an alignment in terms of their understanding. And I think that connection of being young black British artists um, within art schools that perhaps um, didn't seem to have a sense of understanding of their practice and you know the, their interest that they were they were interested in in communicating to their art and you know um and so i think maybe there was an alignment there and um subsequently you know piper then became um a key member of um the black art group so it wasn't originally the wolverhampton black art group but then it went on to just they changed their name um so it was just the the, uh, the black art group um and it was that group was seen as kind of like a radical black alternative to the creativity that was, as I mentioned, being promoted in art schools and also wanted to challenge art institutions. Um, and so I think, um, you know, what's important for Coventry then is there was this point at which the, these two artists met and then go on to be um, key figures within, within um, the art world. And I think um, Keith Piper in particular kind of talks about the importance of, of Coventry um, in terms of, its connection with two-tone um, and, you know, kind of this coming together of like white working class culture and um, anti-racism and, you know, the coming through in the music. And I think he said, that's what makes it really important for Coventry is because this, you know, Coventry the home of two-tone. So there's this moment where, you know, music was speaking out against, um, some of the things we mentioned earlier around the way in which um, black people were being treated within the country. And so I think that, you know, that moment is really important to kind of think about in relation to um, the context within which the group, um, in which the, the group met. Um, that's, I think Keith Piper has talked about that's what made Coventry unique because it showed the possibility of new and particular forms of cultural and political expression. And then, as I said, they then, um, you know, Keith Piper and Eddie Chambers went on to, to work together um, to Can create a series of exhibitions. Um, one of those being, you know, the Pan-African Connection exhibition. So the exhibition Pan-African Connection at the Hermit in 1983 represents a key moment of this activity. So do you want to tell us how that came about and its reception in Coventry? Um, yeah, sure. I think um, as I was saying, you know, the, the Wolverhampton Black Art Group then became um, the Black Art Group. And one of the things that, you know, the Black Art Group did was they had a series of exhibitions where they um, exhibited as a group. And we know that um, it was a group where there was changes within who was part of that group, but the, the, the key members that we know of that were consistently within um, the Black Art Group and their exhibitions were Keith Piper and Eddie Chambers, um, but we also know that it included um, Claudette Johnson, Marlene Smith and Donald Rodney to name, to name a few. Um, and so, yeah, they went on, first of all, I think their first exhibition that they had was um, the Black Art and Done exhibition, which happened in um, Wolverhampton Art Gallery in 1981. And then following that, they went on to have a series of Pan-African Connection exhibitions. Um, the first one, which happened in the Africa Centre in London, followed by um, the exhibition happening at the Icon Gallery in Birmingham in 1982. Um, and then later, there was a Pan-African exhibition at the King Street Gallery in Bristol. And finally, the Pan-African Connection exhibition came to the Herbert Art Gallery in 1983. Um, and so, before I talk about the reception that um, the exhibition received in Coventry, I think it's important to kind of think about, you know, the title Pan-African Connection and why that was important for the, the group to have that as a title for their, um, these exhibitions. And it came from the group feeling that they had a connection with oppressed people all over the world, you know, Africa and beyond anywhere, which were, um, there were groups that felt marginalized or oppressed. Um, within these different spaces. Um, and then the term Pan-African Connection also connected to a number of things. Um, you know, the, the group understood or 
communicated that they understood themselves as descendants of Africans dispersed during the slave trade. So they're kind of making these um, global connections to history, um, looking back to the history that came before them and also with an understanding of where they fit within that history. And I think that kind of understanding themselves as descendants of Africans dispersed during the slave trade is really important here. And then this notion of standing in solidarity with victims of racial injustice throughout the world. Um, and I think in one of the, the programs, um, Eddie Chambers kind of um, talks about, you know, Martin Luther King and connects to um, speeches that Martin Luther King um, talked about in terms of um, injustice um, in one, in you know, in one space is injustice in the world. Like you know, there's this kind of um, solidarity in anybody who's facing any type of injustice. And so then you can all see the connections with um, the activism that was happening in America by African Americans. You know, it's also was really important to the group um, and their understanding of who they were and, and what they were creating. Um, and also there was a sense of mobilizing black communities to engage with the arts. I think you can see that quite clearly in the early programs that was kind of a wanting to, um, for their work to speak to black communities. I think that seemed to be quite an important element of, of their practice. And so now um, when we come to think about um, the final Pan-African Connection exhibition, which was held at the Herbert Gallery um, 1983 in February, um, I think what's really important is to think about the way in which this exhibition and the negative press reaction kind of dominated the way in which people came to think about this exhibition and to in engage with it. So actually it became a problematic way, problematic lens in which the, the local community were thinking about this particular exhibition. And um, I think Keith, Keith, you know, Keith Piper, he, he talks about um, this was, the first time that there was an attempt at censorship of one of their shows. So I think that's important to kind of think about that. When we're thinking about Coventry and how welcoming or not welcoming it was for this young um, emerging black artist, you know, I think that's important to kind of, um, to highlight there that Keith talks about this um, first attempt at censorship. Um, and so the Coventry's press response to the 1983 exhibition was heavily focused on race and identity politics. Um, and I think, as I mentioned, in a set of problematic precedents for the way that um, the public would interpret the work from the show. Um, but it also, we, we, what we could see that was happening within the local press in Coventry was that it was a reflection of the way that these exhibitions were being reviewed by the press, by the national press, you know. Um, and what we do know is that the, the context behind um, the problems, the problematic kind of press response was that there was a local councillor who took offence to one of Keith Piper's um, artworks depicting a black man hanging from a noose. And he want, this um, councillor wanted that work to be removed from the show. Um, the artist refused um, and, and said that if the, if the work came down, the show wouldn't open. And so I think what happened then was that that artwork was moved somewhere towards the back of the exhibition and an age limit was placed on the exhibition. So anybody under 16 had to be accompanied by an adult. Um, and I think they were talking about partly um, the visuals of, the, of this particular artwork, I wrote reactionary suicide, black, black boys keep swinging, that particular artwork, they saw that as problematic, but I think they also kind of highlighted that there was some language that they were unhappy with, maybe swearing, which we know, you know, is part and parcel of art, you know, that, you know, that wasn't something that was isolated to this particular um, artwork or the, you know, um, the artists that, the, that were part of the black art group. But um, what you perhaps you can see is there was a sense of the councillor um, wanting to appease white audience members who maybe would feel uncomfortable with the content and the language. Um, and that was perhaps was taking precedence over engaging with the artwork itself. And so this, this kind of trying to force censorship or removal of artwork um, then became the focus of the, um, the press dialogue, you know, you kind of see that in, in, the, in the, the headlines and the, in the discussions that then subsequently happened. Um, and then also what then we do then see is we do then see like members of the public within Coventry kind of writing in and um, sharing sentiments of the local press, you know, then 
negatively discussing the exhibition and um, saying, you know, they can't perhaps understand why this work is on show. They can't understand um, the discussions around racism and the problems with this that the artists have raised. And, you know, all of what all the th these things are important, what they also are doing is um, pushing a particular dialogue around um, identity politics within the work, which whilst we can't remove it from understanding the work, it's not the only thing that the artists were doing. They were artists, you know, first and foremost, creating artwork, which um, was a response to the experiences that they were going through. Um, but I think that, um, you know, we can begin to understand Coventry as, and its response to the artists has been quite problematic. Um, but at the same time, you know, we can, if we think about Britain in the 1980s, this response is hardly surprising. Um, you know, a group of black artists entering a white institution, um, you know, and the, 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 the fact that, you know, uh, a white councillor is struggling to engage with the work and find it problematic. And then we're thinking back to um, comments like those by, um, politicians like Margaret Thatcher but around this notion of being swamped and immigrants taking up space and you know that prob problematizing is there is, is everywhere so this doesn't really um for me kind of come across in any way as a, as a surprise so I think then that becomes um you know we can kind of begin to yeah like locate Coventry and its response as um a mirror of what was happening more widely around um, the country in terms of black people in general, but also um, black artists, you know, more, more specifically. So now a bit fast forwarding um, and, and, and thinking, still bearing in mind um, all the relevant activity and all the inspiring activity of this movement back in the 80s, but also considering that this group of, of artists and some of, of these artists you mentioned already continue working uh, and work and work until today and have a very very important position as well in what is a contemporary uh, contemporary art in in the UK definitely and uh, and elsewhere. So um, if we could draw some lessons and and some of the some of the um, some of the the takeaways, let's say, um, until today, and what we could see as being probably the impact of the group uh, in what is uh, today's uh, British um, artistic production. What do you think that those things would be? Um, I was thinking about this question for a while, actually, um, trying to think about how you know what what I would say, and I think. Um, what I was particularly drawn to and interested in is this idea of collectives and collective action in the arts. When we think about, um, you know, group of young artists, uh, black artists, and you know, sort of coming together um, as a collective and the impact that they had in the arts for subsequent artists of colour that followed. Um, and then we can begin to think about, you know, collectively organizing visibility for artists who had been marginalized and refused space in the arts and collectively coming together to challenge institutions. Um, you know, that was something that kind of I was been thinking about a lot. And I, and I guess I'm thinking about it also in relation to, we've talked about the Pan-African connection and, you know, the, the group, the Black Art Group's exhibition at the Herbert Gallery. And then if we fast forward to this year, you know, we've got the Turner Prize, which also is going to be at the Herbert Art Gallery. And the nominees are collectives, groups. And so I think, you know, we're kind of thinking about that. And um, particularly I'm thinking of the Black Obsidian Sound System, who are one of the nominees for the Turner Prize, um, who actually um, recently, re you know, released a statement where they called out the Tate in relation to their handling of sexual abuse claims and redundancies particularly highlighting the problematic way in which the Tate had handled um, Jade Montserrat's um, situation around um, the way that she'd been treated while she was there and, you know, sexual abuse claims. And, you know, the, the, the Black Obsidian Sound System, you know, they release a statement where they say, we ask ourselves, how can a Black people of colour, queer collective, artists and cultural workers be nominated for the Turner Prize whilst black women artists continue to be silenced. And then they talk about, you know, cases like Jade Monstrance are not isolated in the art world. And I think they're kind of speaking out within that context. I think um, 
I saw recently on Jade's Twitter that, you know, she felt really energized and supported to have this collective speak out on her behalf as well um, in the midst of being nominated for a Turner Prize. And so I think what you can see, like some parallels there in terms of the ways in which collectives can come together to challenge art institutions and the role in which the arts can play in, uh, in terms of um, calling out problematics um, instances, you know, the ways in which artists are treated, the way in which artists workers are treated. And so I think that's um, something that I think um, is a takeaway in terms of the achievement of the Black Arts Movement in the 1980s and the way in which we can still see those types of um, collective organizing um, being visible. Um, and I think it's also important for, um, you know, artists today to have that true understanding of British art history and the place of the Black Arts Movement within that. You know, in order to have that understanding of what what came before, um, and not you know, I think you know it's important to to clarify here that this is you know the history of art history and where the black arts the black arts movement's place within that is not a, a history that should is only to be taught to black students or students of color. This is uh, art history that everyone needs to engage with. White students need to be engaging with to understand. Um, white artists working now to understand what came before, you know. Um, I think that's really important to kind of, as a takeaway, to kind of think about that. And I think, um, you know, I agree with what you were saying um, earlier, Carolina, like thinking about the ways in which that um, the group of artists that we've talked about, um, you know, how they've been able to sustain their practice over a long period of time. So we've gone back to, you know, 1980, 1979, and we're talking about a moment in which, you know, we're talking about artists who were like, you know, late, late teens, some perhaps, you know, early twenties. And then, you know, those same artists, Claudette Johnson, you know, um, Eddie Chambers, sorry, you know, I guess he's more curator um, as opposed to artists, but still practicing within the arts. And then Keith Piper, the, you know, they've been able to sustain their practice over this period of time. Um, and so I think what's really important is that we have a continued dialogue between them and emerging artists. I think that's of critical importance that, you know, we don't historicize and then become nostalgic and looking back, but that we continue to have a dialogue and, and see the ways in which their practice has evolved over time, you know, from what they were saying when they were, you know, making work in, in the 80s to what they're, they're saying now. And I think also engage with the fact that there's been a significant amount of change in that time but yet at the same time, so much has stayed the same, you know, and what does that mean, you know, in terms of um, artists working now, you know, how can they engage with um, that history of the eighties and see the change that's happened since then into the nineties and you know, into the two thousands. And I think also important to kind of think about, and I think Eddie Chambers talks about this quite a lot, you know, that, you know, kind of all this early, activity of exhibitions and spaces being opened up for these artists. Um, and then the 90s where, you know, silence, you know, and, and I think, you know, it was quite a difficult period for the artists that we're talking about. And I think um, Keith Piper has talked about 1989, I think, or I'd have to double check 1990 being a blank page for him where, you know, so I think it's just kind of thinking about like how they sustain their practice and maybe thinking about, you know, it's not just like a straight line, but there's been ups and downs and, you know, various ways that things have worked well, but also been problematic. Um, and so I think those for me are kind of the, the key things that we need to take um, to think about in terms of like um, takeaways and achievements. Um, and particularly, you know, this idea of challenging institutions, um, not just um, galleries and spaces like that, but also art schools, you know, I think there's something really important about what they were doing about, you know, speaking up and saying that the education that they were receiving, the art schools that they were in, were not able to engage with them and the work that they were trying to create. And, you know, I guess it's to, to think about, like, you know, how much has that changed now within arts institutions? And I, I guess I think about that because my PhD was in, was looking at the experiences of black African students in higher education, art and design, and to see how some of those narratives were really prevalent in um, the interviews that I had with um, art, you know, with um, students, art students. This was about, you know, five, you know, five, six years ago. 
And, you know, so much of what those um, students that I interviewed were saying was that, you know, they, they didn't feel like the tutors could engage with the work that they were making. They felt like, you know, sometimes their work was being um, pushed into a particular problematic dialogue that they were interested in, you know, like they didn't only want to make work about their identity, you know, like they, you know, that wasn't, they might always, that might not be always what they want to do, but they felt like they were being pigeonholed and sort of pushed in that direction, but also feeling like lecturers and tutors just couldn't engage with their practice and couldn't engage with their practice and give them critical feedback. Um, and so I think it's just thinking about, you know, yeah, the ways in which, yeah, um, artists from the Black Arts Movement were kind of challenging that, that problematic mm -hmm. space in art schools and how that, some of that, it's, you know, a lot of that it's still in, is still problematic now and thinking, of, yeah, and I guess it's just kind of thinking about the, thinking about it in, in, in those terms, I guess, yeah. Thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank you, Sylvia, for sharing your thoughts with us.